at, at the public, all based around the same group of people called the Apple Family. And, and, the, and, and the first play was called uh, The Hopey Changey Thing, the second one was called Sweet and Sad, and then, and then I'm working on the third one right now. And they, I've had a commitment from the public, from Oscar Eustace and the public, in which he's committed to doing the plays before they're written. And what's it, what's so each of the plays set has the exact same set. So I have the same set, I have the same actors, same character playing the same characters, but a different play each time. And then the and then the odd thing is that each play uh, uh, will open or has opened on the day that it is set. That's uh, so it's an extremely immediate experience. For example, the last mm -hmm. one, Sweet and Sad, uh, was written, was set on and opened on this uh, September 11, 2011, the 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. and, and the next play will open on November 6, 2012, which is our election day, and is set on that day. So I'm writing a play set. Right now it's set the future that will open in the present and then run in the past. Are they political? <laughs> uh, depends on what you mean. Why don't you explain? What, what do you mean by that? Well, no, I want to know what you would mean by political. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a long explanation. Well, okay, okay. we got an hour. Um, <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it's a, it, what is a, I mean, what is the political play? Uh, um, it, it, it's, a, it's a really important and complicated. Uh, um, thing to think about. There, there are kinds of plays that which are uh, which you would call agitprop plays or plays that are dealing with specific subjects and trying to convince an audience or people of a specific point of view. That doesn't interest me. That, that has value, but it doesn't interest me. It doesn't interest me basically for, for, for the simple reason that I think it's an abstraction of theater as opposed to an essential element of theater. It doesn't use theater for what it really is. The theater for me and I, I, I used to tell my students this all the time when I taught for a very short period of time. Uh, theater is the only uh, uh, artistic form that uses the entire live human being as its expression. The entire live human being, in front of live people. Live people, live people in the same room. That is the essence of theater for me. So um, what that, what, what that, what that means is that the theater also carries with it, by its very nature, a point of view of the world. And that point of view is, is humanistic. Theater is a humanist art, art form, by its very nature, by what it is. Human beings at the center. So it's not ideas that are at the center. It's not an ideology that is at the center. It's, it's, not a, it's not an agenda that's at the center. It's the complexity and the, the confusions and ambiguities of human beings that are at the center. So, when I say that a, you know, an agitprop or a play that has a certain political agenda, I say, I say it as an abstraction of theater because it doesn't use really the essence of theater. It just takes an element of it, which is a presentation of something other, and doesn't really use really what it uniquely is. Now, put that set aside, I believe that if you have a human being and you put him, on, him or her on the stage, that human being exists in a society, in a culture, in a world, and, and, and you want to deal with that individual dealing or reflecting or confused about that society and that, in that world. So, in that sense, I, my plays have a, a my plays have a, 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 a political place in the sense that, in the sense that that, 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 that my characters by my own life experience and the world that I, I, I live in, my characters have political concerns. But those concerns aren't necessarily what my plays are about, but the characters have political concerns. So is that a political play or is, I, you know, I, I don't know. It, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's such a big issue that, that When we were through the 1990s and we watched the final stages of what I would say the end of ideologies, and if you felt as a playwright like I did a responsibility of somehow putting on stage a, a world that reflected the, the culture and country that I lived in, then it was it was it became an interesting it, it, dramaturgical playwright issue of how do you how do you hold 
that together. How do you how do you put a society on stage with with, with without an ideological framework? It became a very interesting question, and it's one that's still being debated and discussed or attempted at. The, the playwright, our friend David Hare, David Hare has turned his sights in a very different way, trying to solve the same problem, which is in a journalistic format. His m most recent plays, most of his most recent plays, he's actually gone out and interviewed things, interviewed people and put the interviews together to create a kind of journalistic framework, which is a non-ideological framework, but one that deals with social, immediate social issues. I've, I've tried in these Apple family plays to, to make something so immediate so, so, so in which the room is all experiencing exactly what my characters are experiencing, is what's happening in this election, or how do we deal with a 10th anniversary of 9-11. That, that's, that's somehow the very nature of the society and social issues are just, are given within the conversation of that room. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I felt when I watched it that they were people who were reflecting politics without knowing they were. You know, I, 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 it was an odd exercise. It was the way it, it was uh, as if you made us aware of how they were revealing themselves at moments when they weren't aware of it, which I I'd never seen quite that way. But usually, when you when you deal with a playwright who uh, would present themselves in some way politically they'll tell you at some point what the person represents, what, what the weight of their value is. And you didn't do that a lot of the time, or you did it in reverse, so that the person seemed to be pointing for something, but it was really quite a different thing that you were watching them fulfill. You know. and, and, and because, the, 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 and it was interesting, I had some people who were first read, to say, the first play, and assuming, oh, that's going to be the, represent this part of the, the, the ideological issue. That, that, that. I said, no, 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 you got it all wrong. You got it wrong. They're, gonna, they're all going to contradict themselves in this play. They don't know what they believe. Yeah. That's what the point is. And, and, and when I, because I directed these plays, and when I talked to my actors at the beginning of rehearsal for each one of these plays, I said to them the same thing, that our job in this, on this stage, on this stage, is very simple or very clear. It is to put people on, on, on stage who are as complex, confused, ambiguous, lost as any one human being in the audience. And, said, and we will always fail. But that's our ambition. And that's it. Period. No more. So you, so you, you see that, that I'm not sure that strikes one as, a, as, a, as, a, as what a political playwright should be saying. Well, I, I mean, I think it, it's very, it's, it could be seen as a very political position to take in a play, because it's the it's almost the antithesis of everything Western Western theater has been about since the Greeks, where there's some somebody in the chorus or somebody who represents kind of the the, the, the normalizing core of, of the audience who states what the proper position is at some point, and that that way you gain what what, what maybe a visual artist would gain by perspective, everything falls into the right perspective. You know? But, but you have that, but you, but what you remember, what do you remember about Greek drama? You remember the characters, you remember the people, you remember Medea. I only but, remember you know, the chorus. Of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I, I, it, what do you remember of, about Brecht? What, what is really moving about Brecht? But, you know, it, it, it's, it's those moments in Galileo where it's the human being, those moments in Mother Courage, when it's Mother Courage, you know? That's, that's what seems to be still alive. Yeah, but, but I, the distinction I'm making is, yeah, that's the memorable part. That's what you try to reach when you go into the heart of the people. But I think to make the audience feel that they understand the experience as a common bond, there's usually an element in the play that tells you, oh, that was a good argument, Iphigenia. What would, you know what I mean? Right. And I see everybody in the audience would go, yeah, it was. Without that, they might worry. You know? And you're saying you're taking all of that information away. That's right. So there's no way you can line yourself up. That's a political position. <laughs> it's saying we don't have it anymore, basically. Entropy. Uh, why did you start directing your own suit? I started. I have to say something. I've been writing plays for a long time. Uh, I'm 61, and I started when I was 15, and I've, you know, I've, I've written since then, always, many, many plays, um, and I always thought that the playwright should never direct his own work. I, I, I mostly still agree with that, um, 
And I even I wrote a book with a friend of mine, David Jones, yeah, sure. and and uh, called Making Plays: the, 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 direct, the writer-director relationship in today's theater. And I said many times in that book, you know, that I should direct this play. I fell into it over a series of events. Uh, one was uh, just a play at the Royal Shakespeare Company, a, a children's play that I wrote for for the company. And the person who was supposed to direct it, Mike Attenborough, backed out a couple of weeks before something happened. And the artistic director, Andrew Noble, asked if I would do it because they already had the actors and it was just a children's play and they all cared. So he asked me to do it. <laughs> and, I, and I said, I, said I, I would if he would come to a, 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 a run through. And the artistic directors of the Royal Shakespeare Company never come to run through. They just, they just let the director do what they do. And so he came to a run through and, and um, he just looked at me and said, See, I told you it was easy. Yeah, pretty good. It's pretty good, and I, I enjoyed the tech. I enjoyed, it. and then uh, then a, a few. I was in. There was a there was a play of mine. Again, a director backed out. Another director took over. That was not working out, and I, I ended up taking over at the at the request of the producer, the, the production, and and I changed it and, and did a did a good job, and and I began to just sort of do. It sort of fell into it that way. But the main thing is this, that that's just the, the history of it. The, 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 the psychological thing is this, is that I learned, I realized something about my writing, doing these personal things, the, the, the personal directing things, is that, is that when I write a play, I don't hear my play, and I don't see them, and that I feel them. That there's all a dynamic, I work off of a dynamic. I mean, if that makes sense, meaning I could take a play and I could close my eyes and go, and this happens, and this, and this, and this, and, this, and then that's it. That's, I sort of see that. But so that feet don't feel is right. So, so I, I realized I could go into a rehearsal, and even though all the actors go, oh my God, he's the director and the writer, he knows everything, knows all the words, everything is going to be terrible. I would go, I go, I don't know how to do this. I really don't know how to do this. And they, and, and they didn't believe me for a while, but then after watching me, they realized that I didn't know it. And I would just simply say, I said, look, I, just what I said, I, I feel the plays, I don't know how they should be done, but I feel them, so it's up to us to sit together and try to figure it out, work together, but is the only thing. Because I feel them, I know when they're wrong. I know mm -hmm. when something's wrong. So when it's wrong, just trust me, I say it's wrong, and we'll try something else. That's mm -hmm. all I ask. And so we, we so, and, and I tried to break through every kind of some authority position because there was way too much authority to be in the room. So I, you know, never sat behind the tables, you know, music stand, never quoted a line correctly. All of those kinds of things to make sure that everybody didn't think I was just pushing things on. But I, so I felt that, so so I I I, I found a way of, of working. And having sat for twenty sub years besides some of the best directors in the world directing my work. I've learned a lot, and watched a lot, and seen a lot, and some things I've learned good, and some things I've learned, I, I can see where they made mistakes. And always they made mistakes. The mistake was always the same. The mistake was they didn't listen. They didn't listen to the actors. The actors, the actors, they might have a bad idea, but figure out where that bad idea is coming from. If you trust that actor, if you feel that that actor is, 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 is in the right place, mm -hmm. coming from the right place. Uh, not a selfish place, but, a, but trying to do, do the play. And, and um, uh, uh, so I, um, I can't tell you that. Uh, anyway, anyway so, so uh, I started, you know, I just started uh, uh, directing the plays. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and rumor, by the way, rumor has it, um, I, because I know a lot of actors who have been in his plays, it's very irritating. They all think he's the best director they've ever worked with. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, he's, uh, because I, I, I also d don't think you should direct your own plays, but Richard is a, an exception to that. Too. Most playwrights I've seen are, are, are a wonderful proof that you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> so, we talked a little bit about um, about discussing how theater's changed since. We, Richard and I both met in 75 or so. Right? I think, I, I, I know exactly where we met. You don't, you don't remember, but we met, we met in 1978. Already critical. Yeah, yeah. 1978. Mm -hmm. And we met, I was just there last week. Yep, I'm, we met this in Williamstown in the summer and uh, at the uh, 
Maybe 77. <laughs> Maybe 77. <laughs> at Williamstown, uh, and on the steps. At the Pine Mountain School. Uh, well, first we met on the steps of the main street. There's a little steps down there. Well, a long time ago. He <laughs> <laughs> made an impression, a very important impression. And he's also, also just to say, as I, have, I, have, I haven't said, he's just, just he's an extremely generous man. You, uh, you must know that the, the mentoring that, that Mike has done for years and years and years with, with emerging playwrights. But, but that goes back to me. You know, he was, a, he, was a, he, was a, he was very generous to me. He, 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 and there was one time, because he was, he was making infinitely more money than I was, and, and, and there was one time where he, that I was having some difficulty about something, and he was in England doing a movie. And he said, I'll call you. I'll tell you, I've talked to you about it. He says, you know, this is a movie. That, that they'll let me run up this dab on this phone bill. I can just call, call from the hotel room. <laughs> and we were on the phone for like an hour. I have no idea how much that cost me or whoever was producing that. But, uh, 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 but it's just a really generous man. I also have no memory. I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> so much generosity. So, so talk about a little bit about how, how you're, you see your career, the, the theater changing in the time that you've been in the business. Uh, well, we both, I mean, we both hit the nonprofit theater in America at the time of pretty much, and it's not quite birth for me, but close enough to have seen the seen the baby, um, and the hopes for what the nonprofit theater could be, and where it was coming from, and where it was being, what was driving it, and um, the, it was a, it was a reaction to the commercial theater. It wasn't. Attempting to be the minor leagues of the commercial theater, it was the, it was the, it was the, a real alternative, and uh, it was arti artist driven by and large. The heads of the theaters were artists or people who who, who, who certainly had the artist uh, uh, interests at heart, ambitions with, the, and I mean just not playwrights but also directors, but and, and certainly actors. Our efforts to creating acting companies where actors could work out you know, a living wage to support their families and to have careers in one place that were not, perhaps not as, as, as pathetic as, 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 as had been the case. And, um, and that, uh, uh, that's, that was the hope. And for one reason or another, I, I think I watched that hope fade. I think I think the when at, when I taught students, you know, I, I would tell them, you know, don't look at certain theaters as if they were had existed forever. Look at them. It, look that they could collapse and start your own, or or, look, or, or or rethink things, because inch by inch by inch, by and large, the not for various reasons some decent reasons, understandable reasons, that the, the, the nonprofit theaters have been co-opted uh, by, uh, by the commercial theater, or co-opted into another function of, which could be uh, serving some kind of a social place in the, in the regional theater, you know, like, oh, we have a theater, as opposed to a theater of a huge artistic ambition. And I see that collapse everywhere. I see that collapse I mean, in, in organizations, organizations like the TCG, Theater Communications Group, which has changed its focus over the last 20 years from one of art, efforts at artistic excellence to a broad range, the more the merrier, which is, which is a fine but a very different approach. I see it in, in, the, in where we are right now in the Dramatist Guild, which they Know people who draw my skills, but my my questions and great concerns over the way in which uh, 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 things have changed in in, in, in in how it sees itself in its function. Um, and why do you think that happened? <clears throat> I think I, I think people I, I, I think we're very there's a lot of different reasons money money certainly, um, but I think I, I think slowly the, the, just the natural institutionalization of things. Bureaucracies grow and then feed on itself and grow some more. So I think that it was just not stopped. You have, 
you know, one of the in in interesting differences between the major theaters in England and the major theaters here is that in England, someone is appointed to be artistic director for maybe two terms, terms are about five years. So no one runs a theater in England for more than 10 years. So they're actually, there, it's sort of their watch as opposed to their theater. And what that does is regenerate, hopefully, those theaters every 10 years. Someone new comes in, and whatever. Here, you have, pe you have theaters which are, have been being run by the same people for many, many, many years. And understandably, those people want the theaters to grow with their own age, their own ambition, their size. They want a better salary. They want this and that. And everything grows and grows and grows out of proportion. And so you, you, lose, the, um, you lose basically the thrust. But on top of that, and this is just seriously damaging, is that, is that we, have, we as artists have lost our voice within these theaters. They are mostly management run. And there are very few. If you, going back to our youth, mm -hmm. you look at the, you look at the, to look at the, oh, most of the major theaters in America, and which which would have employed a, a number of artists on salary within those theaters, either as an acting company or sometimes as a playwright working. At, I worked as the literary manager, dramaturg at a number of a few different theaters around the country. Um, they, they they were there were associate directors who were also directing all the you know, certain plays and various things. But it, slowly, the artists have become separated, separated from the um, from the theaters, and that's that's a that's a that, that's a, a, a tragedy for us. And we've lost our voice in terms of arguing our place in. Yeah, I think also that I think decision making has become a committee function rather than an individual function. I remember recently submitting a play somewhere, I won't where, and. Um, the artistic director very proudly said, I think this play is fabulous, but we sub we, we decide by committee. Absolutely. So your play is being read by a lot of people, mm -hmm. and we'll decide huh. collectively whether we want to do it or not. And he was very proud of it. Yeah. You know, and I, I, are you actually saying this is a good, I mean, why can't you just say you like yeah. this? But when, a, 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 a true story, when I wrote a play called Loose Ends, I sent it to the arena stage, Five days later, I sent it to one man who was running the theater. Five days later, I got a, a call back that said, we're doing your play in September. So obviously he read it and just said, we're going to do this. That would not happen now. It could not happen now. And that's not good. I mean, I think the fact is, so I think I'm going to quote somebody very high up. I think it's fine to be. He said, a great institution is the, is the long shadow of one great man. And if that person can't, uh, by man I mean in the, in the, in the, in the sense of human being, not, not male, uh, if that person can't decide that's what they want to do, the way Joe Pat can simply decide, I think you lose the momentum of uh, one person in charge of the, the operation of it. It's not a democracy. It's, uh, it's not at all. It's a it should be an artistic dictatorship, a good theater, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then there's the argument. I once had a, a group of students together, and I asked a, a lawyer, uh, a big, a big uh, entertainment lawyer in New York, to come and talk. And he said something to them that just shocked me. He said, he said to the young artist, he says, you know, it's every playwright's ambition to have his play on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Now that's a very insidious comment. Because it means if you don't have your play on Broadway, you've somehow failed. And so that it means if someone who's not on Broadway is producing your play, it's basically now the minor leagues are trying to get it to Broadway. So everything becomes this channel, as opposed to an alternative to the commercial theater, which is where the nonprofit theater I believe began and where it's getting where they're, where it is now. Right, right. Another thing, if you look at, uh, at, at Richard's article in the, uh, uh, in, at, on the table there, one of the things he points out is that in, uh, in modern uh, production, they assign you a dramaturg or a committee of people to help you betterize your play. Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, this is actually a kind of an expected step. 
And one of the things it does, in, in, in Richard's views, it, is, is it, it uh, makes every play look like a failed attempt mm -hmm. that is now going to be improved into something that's worthy. Yeah. Uh, and, he, and he makes the distinction between that and, say, uh, great texts of the past that are full of incongruities and contradictions. And when you do them, you simply solve those contradictions and incongruities. That's the challenge, right? But I, I, I also think that the other problem is that if you're going to be writing for uh, um, you know, a storytelling medium like, like film or television or something like that, you, you're either going to be doing it as a gun for hire in television or film, in which case you expect to be told how to rewrite your work, or you're going to make a choice, and you're going to get paid very handsomely for doing that, or you make a choice to write for the theater. Because in that instance, you're the boss. You own the copyright. No one can change a word without your permission. <coughs> and you get to say what you want to. You get to see the play you want to see on the stage. But another part of the corporatization, I think, about the not-for-profit theaters, it's starting to, I think it's just out of envy. They think the films are the big guys and the TV are the big guys. And that model of thinking starts to permeate in this insidious way. And they think, well, part of what they do is they give notes, so let's give notes. And they tell you how to make your play better, so, uh, which is ridiculous, because if, if you can't, if the theater doesn't, isn't the place where you're allowed the deepest subjectivity in, in reporting the world, then there's no point in its existence. I mean, as soon as somebody from a not-for-profit tells me, we have a dramaturg, assigned to your play, <laughs> I, I go, that, I mean, first of all, I, it's, it's an affront to me, because what dramaturg can know as much as I know? I mean, these people haven't written plays, they haven't been around as long as I have, and they don't get fired if it doesn't go well, you know? Whereas I have to face all those things so I get better at what I do, just so I won't be humiliated. And I think that that kind of process of not trusting a uh, the individual writer of a play to do what they want, whether it's perfect, whether it's commercial, whether it's what they want or not. It is what the writer wants to, to see on stage. That's the point. Then there's no point at all. Uh, no, sorry, I was wrong. I have feelings about this. <laughs> but that, and that definitely has changed, by the way. I mean, you know, when I first came to back from England, where I lived until 70. Um, you know, then Joe Papp was running the public theater, uh, Zelda Fishhandler was running the arena stage, Nina Vance was running the, uh, uh, the Dallas yeah. Theater Center. You know, you had a lot of people who were rebelling against a system that they thought was crippling, you know, the healthy expression of theater. And I have heard increasingly talk from younger writers now that the not-for-profit theater has become that Broadway, and that needs to just be swept off the map, and a new, uh, a new um, generation of theaters ha has to come into being. And one of the things at the new school where I teach that we're doing is we're, we're trying to train the kids there to start their own theater companies when they get out of school, so they're not looking for work, they're making the work. Hopefully they'll, and, and about four of them have sprung up since the system went into place. And I hope that will either start to give not-for-profit theater a run for its money so they, they, they realize that they have to change the terms of operation a little bit, or it'll wipe them off the map and something new will come in. I think theater has to keep undergoing these, these general, you know, revolutions over time. Mm -hmm. And, and, and following that, the, I, 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 I've been pitching a book proposal for a while, and I can't, I can't get it placed because it's an anthology, but it's an anthology of articles about the theater in two different periods. One is this the period we're talking about, the early days of the nonprofit theater and the end of the, or the, or the off Broadway movement where there was this alternative. But you go 50 years earlier to, to 1910 to 1925, in the American theater, there was a huge movement at, at that time in the same way, arguing the same thing. Uh, for example, in like 1914, I think, uh, uh, the, the New York Times listed that there were 300 books, books published on the theater alone in the United States. It's just it, what, it's an anthology from that time, but just just some titles from the from from the 1950s, 1960, 1970. The changing drama contributions and, and tendencies. 
the art theater, discussion of its ideals, its organizations, and its promise as a corrective for present day evils in the commercial theater. The civic theater in relationship to the redemption of leisure, a book of suggestions. Um, the playhouse and the play and other addresses concerning the theater and democracy in America. The, 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 uh, on and on and on, there's many, many more. It's a, fascinating, the arguments being made. And what came out of that in the 19, 1910, 1925 was the, was the, uh, uh, the little theater movement or the art theater movement. And out of that, of course, came Eugene came O'Neill and a whole, was the, the first real wave of great American playwrights. So, so the, my argument, our argument is with this book, so I was working on two other people, was exactly what Michael was just saying, that, that maybe there's a 50-year cycle, because it's 50 years, 50 years, and now 50 years later. <laughs> And so, so maybe, maybe it just maybe these things have a wave and they break and then they corrupt themselves and, and whatever. And now, because more and more of talk of we need new models, we need, need new alter ways of being alternative to, to this co-opting that's going on. Yeah, no, I you know it's, it, I, I was remembering uh, a, a little talk I, I saw Jose Quintero give at a TCG conference. He was a very uh, dramatic man, and he was saying. Uh, when he started at uh, theater and did, did O'Neill's plays at Bleecker Street, he would go up to to, to Washington Square with a with a uh, you know with a sign and say, "Come on down. There's a play coming here by this guy Eugene O'Neill. You got to see it." <laughs> and he'd get people in. They, it's, he said, "It's free. You can contribute when it's over." <laughs> and uh, he would go around with a he said he'd go around with a metal cup. And he wouldn't look at the people you know, because he couldn't stand to know what they they were giving him. But whenever he heard a clink, he was disappointed because that was a coin. But when he felt the kind of swishy thing, that was a dollar bill, and he was very very happy. He said we we would be overjoyed when we came away with seven dollars for the evening. And then he looked around, and this was all these at the, in the heyday of not for profit at a conference where they pay two hundred fifty dollars to come and stay in a hotel and hear about the greatness of not-for-profit. And he looked around at the entire audience, he said, and you people all expect money. You know, that, that was his <laughs> conclusion. And I realized that the difference between somebody who really gave his life to do what he wanted to do, he didn't think of it as a career, which it would be nice if it was. And it's nice in Europe when you can do it that way. But I also think there's another side of this. You know, uh, it, it may seem ironic coming from somebody who's been successful in the business, but but it, my first teacher was uh, an Indian flautist, Sushil Mukherjee, and he said when I was 14, he said, you know, listen, if you're going to go into the arts, you have to understand something. It's not a career. It's a way of living. Mm -hmm. And be content with that. Find a way of living in the arts. If you try to make a career of it and you fail, you'll be very, very, very disappointed. But if you live in the arts, you can't fail. Mm -hmm. So, just for what it's worth, that's uh, an addition. Mm -hmm. Have we covered an hour yet? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, just following on that, uh, um, there's another thrust besides besides the 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 uh, uh, starting new theaters and new theater models. There's something that I've been arguing for some time, and 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 gotten a little bit of traction, but it's a different way of looking at the theaters that already exist. That, you know, there's a lot of people, in, 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 like was even implying a second ago, that you know, in, in other countries, and certainly in Europe, there's much more money given to the theater, given the arts in America. You know, that's really not true. Probably, I would say that, 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 that probably more money, more public money is given to the theater or the arts in the United States than any other country in the world. And the difference is that the way in which it's given. Uh, we give in the United States that public money is through tax deduction. So, so if someone, say, if anybody still has a thirty just thirty percent tax, a wealthy person thirty three percent tax, uh, pays thirty three percent tax. So a hundred thousand dollar gift to Manhattan Theater Club, actually thirty three thousand dollars of that is our money, public money. But we don't have any say about how that money is used. Um, foundations, which also deal with public money because they're tax free. Um, uh, also have a responsibility dealing with public money. So it's a question of trying to make accountable, making those who actually pay 
a little more accountable or recognize their own responsibility to the art that they're funding. But they actually have a responsibility greater than just dealing with managers in the negotiation. And I, and I have argued strenuously to try to find a way to put artists in terms of theater, in terms of theater, theater artists and funders and, uh, together in a conversation, which I think could actually push theater forward in, in an artistic driven way. Because I think most of these funders would be, uh, if once you could get to them, might be open to some of the suggestions and be quite surprised at what they, what, where, how their money is actually used and how it's being um, uh, 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 protected and kept from, from, uh, uh, from, from, from artists, actually. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a, it's a, it's a, 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 it's a way forward in terms of dealing with the organizations which you have. It's a hugely threatening <coughs> way forward in terms of the managers of these theaters. Right, 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 right. And by the way, all of this, I, I don't think is to, um, to brush aside the idea of having a very commercially successful play. Uh, it's just how you're getting there and why you're doing it that, that really matters. I mean, if you're trying to second guess all the way so that you'll have a popular success, I think you're probably going to do yourself an injury. But I have talked to, to the, the director, Milos Foreman, who I worked with on a, on, on a number of films, who is, <clears throat> came up in Central Europe under um, uh, under a sort of a centralized government, and everything that you had greenlit in the movies uh, as, a, as a student had to have in it somewhere a, a taste of the politics that showed you were on the side of the authorities. And so they got very good at smelling where in the line, it's a little false, but it does prove the party line, and therefore you're going to get the, the head of the um, production to greenlight your film. And Always, they hated that moment in a movie, uh, in a movie script that they had to write. They just didn't, you know. They could see at that moment you'd sold out. Uh, and they used to be shown American films like like Serpico and Chinatown, and they'd, and, and they'd be told, "Look at how corrupt the society is." And all they would be thinking is, "My God, they're allowed to make films like that? That's incredible!" So it was the best advertisement they we we ever gave to the communists to come to America. And what he said is, there was one thing they couldn't stop ever in the, the authorities that was popular success. <coughs> if you found a way to make a film that everybody connected to, the authorities were helpless. So their biggest revolutionary act as filmmakers was to make a film that everybody loved. And that's what they tried to do without insulting the intelligence of the public, but that's what they were going for as a, as a kind of revolutionary tactic. And if you can do that and make a movie the way he did when he made Fireman's Ball, that was a huge success and is a hoot and made tons of money and got him on the map. But it's true. Everything in that movie is true. That's the that's the hat trick if you can do that. So 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 my turn to ask. So so who do you write for? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well that's why I asked you is that I I would say you know it changes, but I, it doesn't actually. I because I once I'm writing, I can't control it. You know, once it, once I start, it just becomes me. And if I try, it's awful. So uh, I I write what I can. I, I mean, I'm always trying to write for everybody, but I, but I have a bad misunderstanding about who everybody is. <laughs> I think they're all kind of like me. <laughs> no, I mean, I really can't. I've talked to writers. Um, who say they they write very specifically for an audience. I've written one child play for children, and I wrote for kids. But the only discipline I gave <coughs> myself is that something had to happen every minute. There had to be some kind of action, because they're not going to listen for long. These are for five and six year olds. Um, and that was the only discipline I gave myself. But otherwise, I wrote the same. And actually, some of the people, some of the places it was done said, that's kind of like a little twisted, you know, what you wrote there. <laughs> and like, that's just how I write. You know, I can't help that. So that that was a children's version of it. But I don't think about, you know, if somebody said, unless it's like, write this movie for a lot of money and it's really stupid, then, I, then I'll write a stupid movie. About it, you know? But that's not writing. That's, that's, that's toil. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what you've, you've, you've 
So what what brings you constantly back to the theater? You have a, you've had a I mean I, I showed you a, a, I brought out a, a book from my my bookcase, 1971 of uh, Mike Weller's Cancer. Mm -hmm. So you you've long 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 career. But why, what brings why do you, what brings you back to the theater besides ownership of the copy? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good reason. You know, I mean, it's, it's the fact is they can't they can't take it away from you. And once it's there, it can be done a lot of different times. So even if it's not good in one production, it can be good in another one. You know, you have a lot of chances to make to prove it. Right? And also, there's a there's a certain thing. I mean, everybody hears a playwright. I mean, a lot of people hear a playwright. So you know, when you get in a room with actors and you're discovering things together, and then you're putting up a show and people are coming to see it, it's all very immediate. And I, there's a kind of high about that, about the momentum of it, that doesn't exist in other mediums, where you really, you know, you film, you stop, you edit, how was that take? No, let's do it again, wait, there was a shadow, there's a boom mic, let's do it again tomorrow. You know, that drives me nuts. <laughs> and then you never get to see the, 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 the um, performance flow from beginning to end. The actors <coughs> never get to take over and make it their own. And I like all that. You know, I like to see an actor do things I never anticipated with a, with a line, with a scene. Uh, I like to see the thing unfolding and go, God, there's a whole scene here I didn't do. I could put it in. That's mm -hmm. all great stuff. You know? I like that. And, every, and, and I like to see audiences watching that. I like how, how different they are every night. You know, there are some nights where it's like the audience that ate its young. They just sit there <laughs> and, sit there and, like and then the next night, the same play. You can't even see. I mean, we'll, we'll go back and go, oh, they really played it great tonight. But you know, you don't know why. The next night, they're roaring and they're just totally involved in it. The mystery of that communion in in a, in a performance is, to me, a really exciting thing to watch over and over again. There's a sort of uh, sort of really ineffable quality about the contact that happens when it's when it's good, when, it, when it's going right, and it's a really interesting thing when it's not to try to figure out what what's not functioning. Right. What did you do wrong? What did you overlook? What have, what haven't you made clear? What's not interesting? All that kind of stuff. I like that. Isn't it, is there something more in terms of just the form itself, the theater? Because you 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 you, you, you you've written plays in all sorts of forms. You've, you've got Ballad of Sophie Smith is sort of an epic. You've written musicals. You've written, uh, obviously, uh, very sort of domestic plays. You've written, you've written uh, 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 a play about an imaginary uh, uh, cartoonist, cartoonist, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, imaginary characters. Uh, but you, so, so theatrically, you, you keep going at, at, at the form in, from different directions. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, that's. Oh, I like to mess around, you know, with, with yeah. stuff. And I also like to get a sound in my head, a style in my head, or a sound or something, and channel it. You know, I like I like the idea of pretending. Well, you've done that. You know, you've done like like uh, uh, old time farces, but they're Richard Nelson versions of it. Right? And I like that. I like to kind of try to I like to try to channel an old form or a strange form or an unusual form, and see how it comes out for me. And, th and then you see it develop on stage, and it's wild, you know, like you wrote that. It, you, it wasn't conscious completely. That's the other thing when you write. I think there's always a conscious plan in when you say about writing, but then something else takes over. You know, the ghost enters it, if you're lucky. And when you see that happen on stage, the, the part that you didn't know was going on, and you go, oh my God! You know when it starts to when you it's, you start to realize what you've actually done. You, it, it, well, I mean, it can be terrifying because you realize like like there's a part of you you didn't know about that's really bad. <laughs> you, know, you, know, you see it's on stage now and it's really bad. And there's other times when you go, man, I didn't know I could do that. That's great. Mm. So that discovery is 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 really you know, that's worth living for. Mm -hmm. And right. Mm -hmm. And, and, the, and the, 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 the same question you asked me in terms of politics, where you where your work fits within in ah. the political world. Well, I you know I wanted to write political theater early on. I really wanted to write political theater. I, I moved to England when I was at when, 
1966 and studied there. And everything, there, there was a, a lot of very political writing happening. John Arden, uh, John Osborne in a different way, uh, Arnold Wester, Bernard Copps, a lot of people like this were working. And then I went to Venice for the Biennale, where the Berliner Ensemble Company was doing uh, Three Penny Opera, Coriolanus, and Artur Uli, those three productions. And I was floored by the, I've never seen theater like this in my life. It was perfect. I mean, the tiniest character in the crowd was doing something so specific. You understood everything about his life just by the way he was reacting to a speech. So I, I, I decided I'm going to join the Berliner Ensemble, and I'm going to, that's my future. So I found out where Helena Weigel was staying. I don't know if I've ever told you this story. No, I found out where she was staying at the Excelsior Hotel. And I camped outside her door. <laughs> and they tried to get me away. You know, these very polite Italian you know, hotel workers tried to you know, reason with me. And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm waiting for Miss Weigel. So she finally came with this entourage behind her and said, oh, you're the American that's making all the trouble. Well, come on. <laughs> and she invited me in and poured me some sherry and said, so now tell me, wh what do you want to do? I said, well, I want to work for the Berliner Ensemble. I'll do anything. I'll sweep floors. I'll, you know, whatever. And she said, uh, oh, this is so charming, this, this American enthusiasm. <laughs> you, of course, you know German, yes. I said, no, 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 but I can, I'm very quick. I, 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 you've read, of course, all of Marx. And I went, well, we did, I, there was one lecture in it, you know, in the school, I read, I think I read that chapter. She said, well, that's our lingua franca, at the, you know, in the Berliner Ensemble, so you have to be familiar with all the work. And here's what I would suggest. Go back to England, read all of Marx, learn German, and then I promise when you come to see me next time, I'll see what I can do. That, so that was my introduction to political theater. Right? <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, the spell wore off when I got to England again. Although I did take German, and I did learn some Greg poems in German. And then I realized, little by little, that I, I didn't believe that, that political theater per se you know, David Hare was doing Fan Shen and that kind of the early work that he did. I didn't think that that was hitting it right. And that's exactly the time that I saw The Fireman's Ball, which was playing at the Curzon Cinema. And it was just about firemen putting on a ball. Right? It, it, if you hadn't told me it was a political metaphor for Czechoslovakia, I would have just thought it was the funniest movie I'd ever seen about firemen. And that, suddenly I realized, was that was great political theater, because it was about itself. But if you understood how to watch it, it was about everything that, that you couldn't say any other way. And I thought more and more that if I want to write plays that had to do with the, the form and pressure of political circumstance on people's behavior, it would have to be by micro observation and by just getting their behavior right. Because nobody does anything that's not finally politically determined in some way. That's what I decided. And so that's the direction I work on. And, and did you, I mean, I've never asked you this. I mean, you, you, there's, a, there's, a, there's a span of your work which is really just tracking a, group of, a, a, a generation, really, different people. Mm -hmm. But it's just, Certain age, and then certain age, and certain age, and that sort of has continued. Has that been a conscious, or is that just something come out? It's just coming out as you grow older. You write about. Uh, the, the no, I think if I grew up in a family, I'd write about family, but I didn't. So I wrote about the people I grew up with, which was my cohort horizontally. That's who I just knew best. So I wrote about what was around me. But I do think if I had a family growing up, I would have probably written with the same intensity about them. Group. Yeah, the group was my family, in essence. So I was coming to know the world through them. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I, 
I mean, I too tried <coughs> a certain plays like Some Americans Abroad, which is a play yeah, about right. a group of people, or two Shakespearean actors, which is a play about an acting company. Can and you hear, by the way? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. no, I'm sorry. <laughs> just shout. I, 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 I You're talking about two, two Shakespearean actors and Some Americans Abroad that are plays by, by Richard about a groups of people that he, that he was comparing to the, the groups that I wrote about. I mean, it, I mean, it's when when I um, when, when I started to try and find a way out of a non-ideological world. I know that sounds slightly pompous, but I, but I, but I, I think that's what I was trying to do as a writer. My 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 conscious solution became one of looking for groups. But, which then I distilled into about a family. And, and the writer who suddenly loomed and became very, very important to me was, was Ibsen, who was a the writer who had meant <coughs> almost nothing to me. <clears throat> but I found, I suddenly realized that those places take like Enemy of the People, which often is seen as some kind of big epic. It's about the city, about the town, about, about the whole whatever. It's really just about family. There's two families in the play. Everybody's either in the newspaper or everybody's in Stockholm family. That's, that's it. There's one other exception, and a drunk. Um, uh, and it's, a, it's simply about a family, realizing that, that the family unit, or in the case it, with, with Mike is talking about, which is a surrogate family unit, it, it, is that it, they're, they're within the dynamic of, uh, is, is our society. So a one way in which I have been, in my steadily trying to get out of where I was, or move on from where I was, was to try to find a, um, a way of articulating the complexity of the society without gluing it together with an ideology, if that makes sense. And so, and so uh, uh, the, the glue, what's really holds it together, is something that we in the audience, with the audience in the play, will always share, which is the nature of a family, because everybody has a family of some sort or another. So that the family unit, in terms of playwriting, which has become, you know, the notion has become sort of slightly disparaged as a sort of a, you know, an insular looking way of, of talking about the world. But in fact, within that family unit, I mean, this is probably only uh, probably obvious to everybody, but but, but to me, um, uh, within that family unit, became the potential of of representing pretty much every twist and turn that one could find within the society at large. Hmm. Um, and that, 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 so the focus, that in, the intensity of that, of that of, of focus came about constantly working out those very, working on the exploring, articulating those, those ever-shifting relationships as it, as, as it was reflecting the society as a whole, in that sense. That, um, yeah, it makes good sense, yeah. Um, I think we should have some questions. Yes, so, oh yeah, Terry, why don't you uh, <laughs> moderate? Uh, and, and, do sh and if I, I really please shout out if, I'm, if you can't hear me, just shout out. I'm, I, I Remember it's her birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Don't ask how old I am. <laughs> uh, yeah, my name is Mark Weston. And I've been teaching at the Screen Actors Guild Conservatory, writing in my 19th year now, helping actors use that dialogue that they, they have, that ability to write dialogue, and many have succeeded. I was blessed oh, many, many years ago in meeting a man named Dwight Taylor. I don't know if anybody knows the name, but his mother was Lorette. And Dwight gave me something I feel is the most precious thing I've ever gotten as a playwright. The use of the theme. The use of finding that one major theme and allowing that to take you through. You know, and I wondered if that hit any kind of knowledge or, or understanding here. The use of a theme, before you start writing, know the route, know the main area you're headed for. Does that well, I didn't sense? meet him in time, so, you know, <laughs> I've been winging it. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. No, I mean, no, no, I mean I'm not aware of ever having a theme, uh -huh. really. I'm, I'm aware of a tone. Yeah. And I'm, I'm aware of sort of stuff I want to probably say. Uh, but it, I don't know. No. I, I, I'm never aware of a theme. 
and therefore my work is probably shallow. But <laughs> I, 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 do you think it's because you started the music that you, you hear a tone first as opposed to... No, I don't to think that's what he means by theme. I mean, I know mm -hmm. dramaturgically when people talk about theme, what they mean. It's a kind of unifying think area, you know. And that's not the way I unify. Mm -hmm. Simple question. When you have an immediacy, when you have the date, and you have the theater, and you have the actors, is it easier to write at that time, or uh, or more difficult? Uh, it's just different. It's scary because you have a you can't get out of it. You, you can't. You, you know you have to do it. So that's scary, and that's liberating, and that sense of confidence is thrilling. Confidence that people have in in, 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 you, in you, and the confidence you have in yourself to do it. You get yourself into that predicament. Um, so. But it's, it's 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 a different kind of uh, 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 of problem. Each is a, each is different. I, if I have a choice, I'm very happy to know to know that my thing is going to happen when it's going to happen. It's going to happen. With, I'd rather go that way than simply into a void. I'm lucky. Yes. Yes. Hi. Um, in view of what you were saying earlier about um, before you started doing it, direct. Uh, writers shouldn't direct their own play. And then you sort of eased into it, so to speak. Do you feel, or did you feel, that way about performance, actors performing, because I'm an actor as well, performing in their own work? Because I've had negative and positive opinions about that. I, I mean, I would guess, I, and I've not really, I don't really have much experience. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a performer, and I don't, I know a number of performers who have written one woman or one man shows and do that sort of thing. Yeah. That that makes sense to me because that's all of an event, and I, right. I totally get that. Yeah. To do to write a play and then act in it is I, I, I carries with it a lot of problems, a lot of complications for the director, for the other actors, the question of authority, actually what's going on. Mm -hmm. You you have something. You, 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 have, you have a process that's about, that should be about searching. Everybody's searching together towards a goal. Right. But if you have one person in the room, certainly who should be searching, who knows the answers, then you have, then, you, then, every, then the, the searching starts to feel bogus, I would think. So that's what I, see, that's what I meant as the playwright, is that I don't have the answers, and therefore I, can, I convince the actors that actually it's a real search, and it really is because I don't know what, what, what I'm doing and, and, and what should be. And if, so if an actor felt the same way, they wrote it, but they don't know how to do it, and they're willing to open themselves up to a search with other actors, then I could think it would work. Yeah. But if they know, then I think that's a problem for everybody else. Does that make sense? It makes sense. It hasn't been my experience that I know a couple of things that I've done, because I learned from, oh, it's that's what I meant when I, and I hear the other actors bringing it out. So I know what you're saying. Yeah. Hi. John, do you know when it's time to share the work? When, when in a certain point in your writing, it's time to share the work? Or do you have different times where you're like, I just have a few scenes, someone's got to see it, or it's got to be this certain point, or it depends on the personality? Well, when is the time to turn it over? I have a strong, I have strong opinion on it. I think that you turn over when it's done. <laughs> that, that, that is, when you know you've done everything you can. I think what Mike was referring to, what I wrote about earlier, is this whole world where everybody is being helped to write their play. I think that's a very dangerous thing to play right. You should take hold of your own play and finish it. It doesn't mean then you won't change it. You don't listen to other opinions and change those, but do the best you can. The moment you open up and say, I don't know how to finish my play, help me, I think you're in big trouble uh, and you're opening up a huge can of worms yes. that I don't think you should open up. That's a, my strong opinion. Oh, I, I, um, I have three people I send my plays to over, now this has taken me 40 years to find them. And, uh, and the other thousands that I've given it to, I, I didn't get any good information from them. 
So I found three readers that I give them to give my place to when I think there's nothing more I can do. And uh, and I listen to what they say. I have the same. I, I have like five people who are my first readers, but only when I'm done. Mm -hmm. Are they professional? I mean, are they in the profession or are they uh, a, a mix? Mm -hmm. or? They're all very if, advanced if, people. You, you know what I mean. You know. <laughs> so when you say that? You would have heard of them. They're, they're all advanced so, people. Yeah. Not, one's not in the profession. Mm -hmm. There's a wide range from, uh, uh, you know, someone who's a designer, someone who's a director, you know, various, a, a range of, of people. Mm -hmm. When you guys started writing, there was no internet, there was no cable television with a thousand channels, there was no mm -hmm. video games. Um, do you worry that theater has become more of a marginalized part of our culture, and do you worry about that going forward, the, the role of the theater in American life? I know it's happening, but I don't worry about it. <laughs> I mean, because there's nothing much I can do about it. And when you say marginalized, um, I think it's a different experience that you have in those two, in, in, in very fast media like Twitter and internet, Facebook, and all that. I mean, that's certain, a certain way of communicating happens in that you know, way. But in a theater, it's a totally different kind of communication. And it, you know, the, the big problem in, for me in theater is to, to reach the audience I want to be speaking to. Because um, you know, it used to be I, wanted, you know, I just wanted to get very young people in the, in the theater to be watching my plays. And when I first started writing, that's who came and I was writing about them. But now, when I'm writing, I'm, I'm not writing for the same cohort. And when I meet very young people, I wonder how I could possibly write anything <laughs> that they would understand. You know? um, but I do, you know, I don't worry that, that I'm being made, um, uh, you know, I'm marginalized by the internet. I think that the, the, the art is changing. It's becoming a different thing as it was, for instance, when I remember when as a kid, like I was six or something, and there was a big argument in my house because there was a huge event happening, and who was going to look after me was a thing, a big debate, they couldn't get a babysitter, and there was no way they were not going to go to this, and there was a big argument about this. It was a reading by Robert Lowell, and it was like impossible to get tickets to. He was a rock star. You know, so I got left behind because they had to go and see Robert Lowell. <laughs> and now you could say, is he marginalized now because we have like a rap? No, you still Robert Lowell, you still read his work and you still get a lot out of it. It's just not, it doesn't occupy quite the same cultural <coughs> niche that you really used to. No. And I think, um, uh, as I was saying earlier, the theater has a, is, is a unique thing. This, this, that, that phrase I use, it only uses use the entire life human being as expression. But I mean, what, what that really means is that it's the only art in which human beings are talking to other human beings where they're listening and watching in the same room. It's the only, only thing. And I think Twitter will fade because some other invention will come in. I think the internet, will, as we know it, will change and fade because some other invention is. But we can't. There's no new invention for people sitting in the same room and listening and talking to each other. And as long as that exists, there'll be theater, and theater will be a significant and important part of any culture. It may be buried at times, but it will always be there because of what it is. That's, that's great. <laughs> A three-part question. I wanted to know, on average, how long it takes you each to write a full-length play, and I was wondering how many readings you do, and then when you're directing, do you make any changes to the script? Have you been tempted, when you heard an actor maybe struggling with a line, to rewrite the line, or do you hold fast to the original line? Uh, I, let me answer the last one okay. first. Okay. This, is one, this is what I remember. Uh, uh, the, what I do in a rehearsal room is that I, I always tell the actors that I'm throwing the playwright out. Okay. Because I don't want the playwright in the room. And, and, and then I say, he, I, then I say, at night I go and I pour him a drink. <laughs> and I, I talk to him about the problems and I know he's stubborn. 
and maybe I can convince him to make some changes that we all know are necessary. If he doesn't make those changes, then we just got to take what he's given. So I do that over and over and over again. But I would never, I do not change, change lines in rehearsal because you need to think. a lot of questions. <laughs> I don't change them in rehearsal because that's just too dangerous because I'm wearing another hat doing it. It's just too good. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, let's pause, not think about it overnight and come back. Mm -hmm. So that's that's my re rehearsal in terms of how long. Uh, you know, it, it's a, it, it's how, what is writing a play? Well, the play is what the 90 pages, 95 pages, something like that. Mm -hmm. You know, double space. There's not that many words in a play. That physically, mm -hmm. it doesn't take you long to actually punch out a play. Mm -hmm. But a play is a, much more than punching it out. Mm -hmm. So so is it. Is it is it where you, where you have something in your notebook and you've been thinking about it or whatever for the last 15 years? <laughs> have you been 15 years to write the play? Or is it the time when you started taking notes specifically for something and how long was note taking? Or is it when you start to put words on it, you know, on the, mm -hmm. I, I always outline it in my head or on paper or whatever before I begin the first scene. Mm -hmm. So I have some sense of where I'm going and some sense of what the whole thing would be. So I sort of have it all in my head by the time I actually write. Mm -hmm. So the writing process is a couple of months, maybe. Um, uh, uh, but but the preparation for that is can be okay. years. Okay. And what about readings? How many readings would you have? Like, I'm, uh, I'm going to ask, when you're in the reading process, is, is it possible then you're changing lines with the actors? I, I mean, I, I, think, I, think a reading, I think readings are very, very dangerous. Okay. I'm not saying they can't be helpful, but they are dangerous. You have to be very careful about what you get from a reading, what you want to get from a reading. You've got to know. I use this in this article that, that Mike mentioned. It's outside. I make. It, I, I talk about how, you know, in a reading, if you have a, if you have a, 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 a play which two people are sitting next to each other and talking to each other like this, and you do this in a reading, it makes all the sense in the world. You totally understand what's going on. But if you have a scene, much more interesting scene, I think, with five, six, or seven people moving around, getting up, whatever, who they speak to, who they don't speak to, whatever's going on, and you try, if that's the scene you write, you try to do that in a reading, it's not going to make any sense. And people, if people, you allow people to judge that, or you start judging it yourself because it's mm -hmm. not working, because the, the format of the reading doesn't allow it to work, certain dramaturgical mm -hmm. structures, or, uh, then, then you have to be very, very careful. So it's when I mean it depends on what you what I'm doing. I I, I don't have I, I have readings I have readings that the theater insists after they've agreed to do it. I I will never participate in in person in a in a reading for judgment. I, mm -hmm. I won't be there because mm -hmm. it's just not fair. I don't want to see my work. I want I don't want to look through people's eyes that way at my work. Mm -hmm. um, but if they've chosen it, then sometimes it's a very useful tool to begin to sort of cast without casting. That you bring in people to see if they can do certain things and try, try certain things, and it's useful that way. So there's a very there's a useful element, but in the actual writing of it, um, except for these plays that I mentioned that, that, are, that I'm writing about a specific time that's still in the future, I have, it's been helpful for me because I know the writing process has to continue up to opening night because I'm constantly changing it to fit what's happening in right, the day. Right. So then I find having a reading, you know, a, 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 a useful to just mark the moment where I am in this writing process. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Michael, you oh, um, well, I do, I, I have to have readings because I, you know, I don't have a theater that's sort of devoted, I, I haven't built up those relationships Richard has with theater, mm -hmm. so if I want to interest a theater in my play, I have to arrange a reading where the artistic director mm -hmm. comes and attends and stays away through from being there. <laughs> uh, then I have to, you know, wait nervously while they say they'll do it or not. You know, but it's always an audition for the play. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, and I've had the, the experience actually with Joe Cap. Uh, he read a play of mine years and years ago and said, no, I'm not interested in this. And then we finally got a reading together of it, and he came to that. And he said, smart rewrites, smart rewrites, I'm doing that. <laughs> and I hadn't touched it. I mean, I hadn't touched it. So in some respects, it's, 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 it's a tool to help people who don't know how to read plays anymore realize what it is on the page. 
And there are a lot of people who really can't read a play. There are other people in this very room who read plays religiously. That's what they like to do. And they can get a lot of things out of the play. It's a rare quality. Um, in terms of how in terms of how long it takes to write a play, it's exactly what Richard said. Some I've had plays that I haven't figured out yet, but I've been torturing over them for I mean one of them for about almost forty years. I just can't figure out how to do what I'm seeing. Other plays somehow focus immediately. They just they fall into place and you write them. It's just uh, you don't know you don't know. What about fifty words? How long did that take? Uh, well, it took, it took not too long to write it up to the last scene, and then I was sort of stuck, and I, was, I put it away. Okay. And then, you know, a long time after, I heard something that helped me finish it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, notwithstanding directing your own work, would you speak to the director, the writer-director relationship, and, and including perhaps when you like to be participating in, in, in that, or in the production, or not in the production? Um, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's the most fragile and, and, and the most intimate, I think, of relationships in the theater, it's, it's the that, that I know of. Um, and each one is different, and each one is, has its own dynamic, like marriage or whatnot. But to show just how odd it is, this book that I mentioned for Making Plays came about because my friend, who's a wonderful director, who directed many of my plays, named David Jones, the English director. David and I were sitting in a bar one day, and, and, and David, uh, we suddenly had to realize that David had never seen another director direct a play. And I had seen some of the great directors direct my play. And then I had a sip, and I said, I've never seen another playwright in the rehearsal room. He said, he directed <laughs> John Arden, Graham Greene, Harold Pinter. Uh, so we said, well, that's going to be our book. I'm going to interview about you about playwrights in the rehearsal room, and you interview me about directors in the rehearsal room. And we'll put together these interviews into the whole process of, of a play, beginning from first meetings through the opening night, the, the process of what the problems would be, what problems have been, and what in, in, in things going on. And it was, it was a, fa it's a fascinating a, a journey because you see just how it's, very, it's a very fluid, very intimate, very complex relationship that can explode in an instant and, but, and, can, and can be incredibly, you know, um, a, 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 just very incredibly productive, artistic. I, I'm, I'm sure it's, it's, it's important, it's really important how you. I used to say to people, you know, you know, younger playwrights, I used to say, you know, just when you meet a director who's interested in your work, don't be thankful. <laughs> don't say, oh, thank you for liking my play. Don't go in it like that. Because the director needs a play to direct. So, you know, to be understanding, respectful, engaging, find ways to understand what that person is saying, you know, it's up to you to figure things out. Let let the director start to suggest casting. Don't you say, oh, I want so-and-so and so-and-so. -and -so. Not because you don't want so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, but you'll learn how the director is thinking by what he's saying in casting. You go, oh, he's thinking that way. That's wrong. Now I know I've got to talk to him about that. But you, you, you need to find your own strategies for understanding what he or she is, is thinking about your play. And the difficulty is that when you interview a director up front, the one thing you can't tell about them is what kind of a ship they'll run. And that's really everything. Once, once you cast it properly, when you're in the room, do they create the right balance of excitement and calm that, that makes for wonderful work? When you're sitting across the table having a drink with them, they can sound great. Yeah. But you just don't know when that ship is out in the water and a storm hits, how are they going to guide it through? So it's always a bit, so you have to ask around and find out how they've done, you know, interview other people who work with them. And then you, you have to also hope, I mean, I've had directors who are great, but they're bad in certain ways. Like they're not good dramaturgically. So I'm not, I know I'm not going to get good notes about 
when something's not working, they're not going to help you very much about it. So I know going forward, I'm not choosing this, 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 this director to guide me at all in fixing anything that's not working, but they're fantastic with actors, and they're, they're going to get wonderful performances out of them, and it's only one set, so they don't have to move things around very much, which they're not good at. So for this play, I'll use them. But for another play where, they, where something has to happen that's much more balletic, choreographed, or timed, orchestrated, uh, that director may be not at all the right person. So you have to not just judge uh, on one quality, but what you need for that play in that circumstance. Thank you. Two more questions, yes? Um, you both sound like strong playwrights, and yet you've both written musicals. Um, could you comment about uh, how you feel about that? Me? <laughs> I, I, well, I, I started, but yeah, I was a composer, I was trained as a composer. And the first thing I wrote was a musical. So I, 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 I and it was very kind of modern, you know, ish. Um, later, Edward Albee made it into a play called Malcolm but I made it into a musical. I didn't have the rights, so I had to call it Fred. And, uh, it, was a, it was a big success in my school. And I liked it. I liked working on it. I liked, I liked the dynamic of music, because I liked music. And I liked writing words, because I liked writing words. And I liked singing and dancing. It was fun. It was a fun thing. You know? And you could make a kind of seriousness through the fun in a musical, which I liked. And I've done it a few times now, and recently, and now I'm doing it with Dr. Zhivago, which is a very kind of mega production, uh, which is coming to Broadway next year. And that's been big. I mean, that's the first time I've actually been part of the crew of a battleship, you might say, you know. Mm -hmm. And I find that my role, I, I, so I gather that the experience I'm having is unusual, because it's pretty harmonious. But my role <laughs> in it seems to be, a, a, you know, solving problems in terms of the book writing and structure, and then basically being the therapist. I'm the calmest person in, in, among them. So I, t I tend to run around and put fires out when there's like late night uh, things. And I get calls late at night, <laughs> and I calm them down. You know, but actually, when you see it on stage, you know, and you see two thousand people watching it. Even though it, it does feel a little alien, like this is not not that much to do with me, you know. It's still kind of cool. <laughs> I find. I like it. Um, uh, I I uh, the first fifteen times I went to the theater in my life to see musicals. My, my mother was a chorus girl, and so she she loved musicals and that's what she took me to see. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, so. And then by the time I reached, you know, 17, I was reading, you know, Arthur Miller, and I was too good for the musical. <laughs> I didn't deal with the musical until I was well into my 30s, when the, the, the director, Trevor Nunn, asked me to, to be a rewrite, uh, uh, or actually a tired new book for music. And, and when he did, he took me aside, and Trevor at that point had, was the director of uh, Cats and Les Mis, and he was, you know, whatever. And he took me aside, and he said, I just have to tell you one thing, the one thing about music. You need to know. <laughs> that, that a musical is an organism intent on self-destruction. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and that's been some of my experience. Um, to, to, to be, to be a, and I think we'll, think we'll we'll talk to Mike again next year. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, it's to, to be a book writer of a musical is 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 is, is, is uh, somewhat of a thankless job, and you are there to, you are everybody's, you know, everyone's punchy butt, to be honest, because you're supposed to solve everybody's problems and, and, and actually make it not seem in the public. So, um, your alliance with, the, with what I found, uh, which made the, the experience with Trevor uh, 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 good, was that the alliance between book writer and director is extremely close for me because you're both involved in almost the same job, sewing the whole damn thing together, mm -hmm. you know, sewing the disparate parts. Um, and, when, and when I've had my most satisfying time with the musical, it was a musical that I, I directed as well, called James Joyce's The Dead. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that, that I was the book writer, and I conceived it, and I directed it, and I was the co-director. 
that that gave me a, a, a sense that this was my vision, or part, a strong part of my vision, was was, was and I had some control over it. That was that was good. Uh, but it's a, it's a, it, it just a sole book writer in a machine is a is a very tricky place. To be. Mm -hmm. Last question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, thank you guys. It's been really incredible hearing your talk and your thoughts. And I'm curious about how you deal with, um, or if you have tools to deal with reviews. And, um, you know, I know that can tools. be like good. Yeah, <laughs> well, because it can be, you know, like good or bad reviews Hammer. just to remain, yes, yes. <laughs> to sort of like keep your, keep your sanity and your, you know, protect yourselves. Yeah. I mean, I do. I mean, I, I always read my reviews, and I always read my reviews when they come out. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't hide from them. I understand people who do, or, or hide maybe be the wrong word. They just don't care or put it aside, or they, they uh, But I find that that it's, uh, uh, you know, I just rather face things and, and, and deal with them. As you get older, it doesn't get easier. But at the same time, you have some history. You have a history with individuals. You say, oh, well, look, they didn't like that either. They didn't like that either. Whatever. Uh, there's a so, so you, you you try to organize it in your head, and you're looking for people. The main goal for me is to look for people who can articulate back to me what my intentions are. Uh, I, I it took me. I, 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 as I said I started in fifteen. The, the very first time that happened to me, and I can tell you, it was in 1986 in London. I took all that time. Many, I wrote many many plays, and many shows had reviews between until 1986. And never once in all those reviews was ever my intention articulated back to me. So it was very hard, and it was a very lonely feeling. And I remember the day when I opening up a review of a play of mine called Principius Victoria. It was done, first show done at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And I opened up a review about Michael Billington and the Guardian. And I remember where I was, and I remember opening up, and I was leaning against this, this, this wall in, 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 in London, and, and, and looking and saying, so I am not mad. <laughs> and that's seriously meant I am not insane. Because if someone can write back to me what I intend, then I've gotten it across somehow. So I look for that. That's a very positive thing. So you can have 10 people say you stupid, slow, hateful, whatever. My God, stop writing. If some person is articulating back your intention, not, not saying, oh, this is great, great, but your intention, like talking back to you. That's what great criticism for the writer at least is talking back a conversation in a way, uh, then, it's, then it's really helpful and it really is, um, pushes you forward. Mm. 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 Great. Well, thank you guys. Thank you.